This is the twelfth lecture on natural response of electrical circuits. <coughs> we have already defined the various kinds of responses that an electric circuit, electrical circuit can have and we have said that natural response is the one which arises due to internal stored energies and the circuit being left to itself to settle. There are no external forces or external excitations. If there are external excitations, then the response that we get is called the forced response. And in general, in general, a circuit may have excitations, voltage sources or current sources or both, and also internally stored energies like electrostatic energy in capacitors and electromagnetic energy in inductors. And therefore, in general, the response of an electrical circuit shall be a combination of natural response and forced response. And then two other terms which we introduced were the transient response, that is the response that occurs at the beginning of excitation and after a long time has passed, the response that you get from an electrical circuit is called the steady state response. So, there are four kinds of responses, natural, forced, transient and steady state. Sometimes natural response and transient response are wrongly identified with each other. They are not necessarily the same. Similarly, the forced response and the steady state response are also not necessarily the same. <coughs> the previous day, I had also introduced to you um, terms like order of a circuit. And we said that a first order circuit is one which has effectively one energy storage element. That is either one inductor or one capacitor, all right. There may be more than one capacitors or there may be more than one inductors trivially connected to each other which behave as a single energy storage element and one of the examples that I gave was something like this. If you have let us say three capacitors like this and there is a resistance here, then you know these three capacitors behave like a single capacitor. It would be C1 plus C2, C3 divided by C2 plus C3 and therefore, this is the effective <coughs> capacitance connected across the resistance R and this behaves as a, as a first order circuit with an effective time constant of this. Total effective capacitance multiplied by the effective resistance across it. Similarly, there may be more than one resistor here, but effectively they behave like one resistor. Similarly, we can have a resistance inductance circuit, which will also be a first order circuit or a multiplicity of inductors connected in a trivial manner, so that they could be reduced to one effective inductance, then that is also a first order circuit. And as an example, I had taken this circuit. Let us say we have a battery V and a resistance R, <coughs> which is connected to, let us say, an inductor L in series with a resistance R, all right. The switch is left in this position for a very long time so that the current that passes to the circuit would be given by V by R1 plus R. The inductance is not effective in dropping a voltage when the current is steady. So, in the steady state, the, the current in the circuit shall be given by V by R1 plus R and let us call this as I0. At T equal to 0, this switch <coughs> there is a connection here. At t equal to 0, this switch is moved in the downward direction. 
all right this is how we indicate this at t equal to 0 this switch is moved to the downward position so that the initial current in the inductor the inductor was carrying a current of i0 now the inductor and the resistor in series they are connected across a short circuit and therefore therefore the circuit will have a natural response it is an example of a first order circuit having a natural response that is we are interested in the behavior of the circuit at t greater than 0 the initial condition is that if I consider this current as I then I of 0 minus that is just before the switch is closed is equal to I 0 I of 0 minus just before the switch is thrown in the other position I of 0 minus this is the indication this is the significance of the minus sign here is I 0 and you know the energy of an inductor cannot change instantaneously and therefore this will be I of 0 plus also all right and you can see you can see that as time passes the inductor shall lose its energy to the resistor the resistor will dissipate that energy and gradually this current should diminish with time and at infinity at time t equal to infinity the current should diminish to zero the differential equation that one can write is simply application of kvl that the drop across the inductance plus the drop across the resistance should be equal to zero because there is a short circuit and therefore the drop across the inductance is l di dt the drop across the resistance is ri and this should be equal to zero this is a first order differential equation and this is what defines the order of a circuit if a circuit natural response can be described by a first order differential equation then it is a first order circuit this is not the only one uh, we could have a capacitor resistor circuit for example let us say <coughs> we have a battery V 0 connected like this connected across a capacitor C and then there is a resistor waiting to receive energy from the capacitor C this is the capacitor C and then we know that if this switch if the switch is left in this position for a long time in this position for a long time then the capacitor voltage V sub C if we call this V sub C with this polarity the capacitor voltage V sub C at 0 minus shall be equal to V0 it will assume the voltage of the battery and if the switch is thrown to the other position at T equal to 0 then the capacitor which has stored energy will now try to send a current through R let this current be I all right it will try to send a current through R and in the process the capacitor will discharge or it will lose its energy gradually the uh, this energy will be lost in the resistance as heat dissipation and gradually as time increases the current will decrease the voltage across the capacitor will decrease and it will take infinite amount of time for the capacitor to completely relax that is completely lose the energy that it has contained and once again since a capacitor cannot change its energy instantaneously the voltage across the capacitor at 0 plus shall also be equal to V0 and if you see the uh, differential equation if you see the equation describing this once again once again it is an application of KVL or common sense all right it says that if the current IR the drop across the resistance IR should be equal to the drop across the capacitor that is V sub C. Now what is V sub C? V sub C had started with V0 at T equal to 0 and as time proceeds this current I it is important to understand this this current I has to flow in a closed circuit and therefore this current I charges the capacitor in the opposite direction which is equivalent to saying that the capacitor is losing charge what is this charge it is equal to 1 by C times 
the charge integral 0 to t i dt. This is the equation. Is this is this equation clear? The charge, the, the voltage across the capacitor at any instant of time would be the initial voltage minus the voltage that it would have acquired in the opposite direction because of the current I flowing in a closed loop. Now, this is not a differential equation. It is an integral equation. In general, in general, we may get an integral differential equation. In the previous case, in the LR case, it was an, a differential equation, pure differential equation. In the RC case, it is a pure integral equation. Nevertheless, one can make it into a differential equation by one more differentiation, R d i d t plus i by c. If you differentiate this, it is simply i over c. That would be equal to d v 0 d t is 0. So, this is also, this is also as you can see a first order differential equation and therefore, this circuit is also a first order circuit. Let us see what kind of solution you get. You are acquainted with the solution to such differential equations, but in the context of electrical circuits, we wish to bring in some more physical concepts and I want you to uh, pay attention to this. Let us take the second circuit first, where our differential equation was R d i d t plus i by c equal to 0. <coughs> now, the right hand side of this equation is 0, which means that this is a homogeneous differential equation, homogeneous differential. There is no forcing term. Well, there cannot be a forcing term because we are investigating natural response. It is quite, it is quite uh, logical that our right hand side is 0, that this is a homogeneous differential equation of the first order, first order homogeneous differential equation. Now, in order to solve this equation, we know mechanically how we do it. You put an integrating factor and things like that or you take the, uh, this quantity to the right hand side and integrate change of variables and so on. All, you, you know all this. We shall do it in a slightly different manner, which is more physical in character, which throws more light into the physical uh, happening in the circuit. We argue that any solution to this e differential equation has to satisfy this d i d t equal to minus i by c. Any solution has to satisfy this, which means that d i d t shall be equal to minus 1 by r c times i. All right. So, what you usually do is bring i here d i by i minus 1 by r c d t, then you integrate both sides and so on. But no, we are not going to do that. What we are going to argue is now comes the physical picture into the into the into the situation. What we argue is that my solution must be of a form such that d i d t cancels i by c or d i d t and minus i by r c must be of, must be identical and a function which amply qualifies eminently qualifies for this kind of a job is the exponential function. You know that the exponential function, the differential coefficient is again an exponential function and therefore, you argue that it must be of the form e to the power some constant s small s times t. Time has to be there, time is the independent variable, it is an exponential function of time, it could be a constant multiplied by time and then we argue that the in general the solution must be of this form, some arbitrary constant multiplied by e to the s t. So, is this, is this physical reasoning clear that the solution must be of this form a e to the s t, a is an arbitrary constant which will be determined by the initial conditions or the boundary conditions of the problem. Exponential function we took because d i d t d d t of this must be of the same form as i, same form as the function and therefore, it must be an exponential function. Now, if I substitute this in the original equation, then what I get is our original equation is r d i d t plus i by c equal to 0 and I substitute i equal to a e to the s t 
this is called a trial solution we try a solution of this form then I get R A S e to the S T plus A by C e to the S T equal to 0 where <coughs> A e to the S T A e to the S T cannot be equal to 0 because this is the form of the solution if this is 0 then of course the current is identically equal to 0 current identical equal to 0 obviously satisfies the equation that cannot be a solution because we know that if the capacitor has an initial energy it shall send a non-zero current and therefore I cannot be 0 therefore A e to the ST cannot be 0 the only other alternative is that R times S plus 1 by C should be equal to 0 which means this S should be equal to minus 1 over RC all right s should be equal to minus 1 over rc in other words the solution to the equation shall be of the form a e to the power minus t divided by rc and you notice that rc the product rc must have the dimensions of time and therefore we denote this as a time constant and we say a e to the power minus t by capital t the only problem that remains is to find out capital A all right that is found out from the initial condition you know that if we if we draw the circuit again it is a C in parallel with R this is I and you know that VC 0 plus is the same as VC 0 minus we recall that this is equal to V0 and therefore what is I of 0 plus it must be V naught by R our solution is A e to the power minus T by T so I of 0 plus is obtained by putting T equal to 0 which means that A must be equal to V0 by R and therefore the total solution is V0 by R e to the minus T by T alright now let us call this as I0 e to the minus t by t okay now the the if you plot this current versus time if you plot this current versus time then it starts at i0 it starts at i0 and falls exponentially and you know how to uh, define the time constant that it is the time after which the current has fallen by how much 1 by e of its original value and so on and so forth the point is the current is decaying exponentially it is only at infinite time small t equal to infinity that the current shall diminish to 0 what is the charge that flows after all the capacitor started with a certain amount of charge which was equal to c times v0 all right so how much charge does the capacitor lose in the process all right that obviously will be obtained by integrating this over from 0 to infinity now so the charge that has passed shall be equal to i0 integral 0 to infinity e to the minus t by t dt and it is very easy to see that this is simply equal to i0 times capital T okay you integrate this and put the limits I0 times capital T I0 is V0 by R and capital T is RC and you can see that this is precisely the total charge that has that the capacitor loses in the process of sending a current to the resistance is precisely the charge that it started with so it loses its whole charge is that clear the, this is the physical reasoning that I wanted to bring into the solution of the differential equation you should not do it blindly you must have the physical picture in mind in an exactly similar manner we can take care of the inductance resistance circuit LR which is short circuited with the current I here I of 0 minus equal to I of 0 plus equal to let us say I0 and the differential equation satisfied by the circuit is L di dt 
plus R i equal to 0. If you proceed exactly similarly, that is you put small i equal to a e to the power s t. Incidentally, what should be the dimension of s? 1 by t, second to the minus 1 and 1 by t is a frequency and therefore small s is called a frequency. We will come to this a little later, the physical interpretation of small s and you will see how nicely it uh, tunes with physical concepts of frequency. But if you try a solution of this form and obtain and substitute this initial condition that is i0 equal to i0, you shall be able to show that i t is exactly of the same form that is i 0 e to the power minus t by capital T where capital T is now equal to r upon L. Instead of r c it is r upon L. All right, And the same kind of argument about the total charge that passes in the circuit. If you integrate this it would be i 0 times capital T. This also incidentally brings in another definition of capital T. Isn't that right? What is the what is the definition? Another definition of capital T. One definition of time constant is the time required for the current to drop by 1 by e th of its value at t equal to 0. Another definition could be in terms of charge that it is effectively effectively the initial current if the initial current had passed for a time equal to capital T, then the charge that is lost would be equal to the actual charge lost by the capacitor or actual charge flowing in this circuit, in this circuit for infinite amount of time. Is that clear? Let us go back here. Tell me. Time constant, you see, can be written as T equal to V0 C divided by I0. If I go back to the original problem. Why did it take so long? Thank you. This is the correct story. All right. Now, an interpretation of the time constant. It's more, uh, it's more evident in the capacitor resistor circuit. The capacitor started with a total charge of V0, V0 C. And you see if it, if it had sent a current at the rate, if it had sent a constant current I0, then it requires only an, a time equal to capital T to lose the whole charge. So you can define capital T as that amount of time is the, is the, is the time required for the capacitor to lose its charge if it maintains a constant current at the initial value. This is another interpretation or definition of the time constant. Now enough about the first order circuit, now let us look at a second order circuit. <coughs> Let us consider <coughs> a um, capacitor C which is charged to which is charged to a voltage V0 all right and then and then at let us say at let us say T equal to 0. This capacitor is first charged to a voltage V0, maybe by connecting a battery across this, a battery of voltage V0. It has in the circuit, in the circuit an inductance and a resistance and a switch. If the switch is open, then the capacitor is, sits pretty, it does not have to lose charge. But suppose the, <coughs> the switch is closed at T equal to 0. The switch is thrown into the lower position at T equal to 0. Then obviously the capacitor cannot sit pretty, it shall have to lose charge, a current shall flow like this, a current shall flow like this, capacitor is charged with this plate positive, so this charge will effectively behave like a battery, you remember the Thevenin equivalent circuit which will tend to send a current in this direction. And 
as time passes, as time passes, the current, this current I has to pass through the capacitor in the opposite direction, which means that the capacitor gets charged in the opposite direction, which is equivalent to saying that the capacitor loses charge. And as time proceeds, it loses more and more charge and therefore the current gradually diminishes, the charge diminishes and after infinite amount of time, the circuit will again be relaxed. That means it shall have no initial energy. Let us look at the equation. What kind of equation do, does this circuit obey? Obviously, once again, it is a simple application of KVL and you notice that the inductor voltage L di dt plus Ri, this should be equal to V sub C, but V sub C starts with V0, then discharges, that is the current charges in the opposite direction 1 by C integral 0 to T I dt. This is the equation that is obeyed by the circuit and you notice that this is an integral differential equation with the initial conditions that what is the initial condition? I at 0 minus is equal to 0 and since this is a current through the inductance which cannot change instantaneously, I of 0 plus shall also be equal to 0 one initial condition and the other is that Vc0 minus is equal to V0 is equal to Vc0 plus, all right. This is the other initial condition. Now, <coughs> an integral differential equation as I have told you is always converted, it can be converted into a differential equation by one more differentiation. We want to get rid of the integral sign. So, what I get is L d 2 i d t 2 plus R d i d t and in the process d d t of V 0 becomes equal to 0 and therefore, we get simply i by c which taken to the left hand side becomes 1 by c times i equal to 0. If you notice, this equation is also a homogeneous differential equation of the second order and therefore, this circuit is called a second order circuit and we are indeed talking of natural response. The initial energy in this circuit comes from the capacitor voltage. It could also instead of the capacitor voltage, it could also have come from an initial electromagnetic energy in the inductor. For example, the inductor uh, could have a current of I0 and then a t equal to 0, t equal to 0, it is connected across a capacitor and a resistor exactly the same way and we would have the same kind of differential equation, a second order differential equation thus defining a second order circuit. Let us write this equation again L d 2 i d t 2 plus R d i d t plus i by c equal to 0. I want to make a point regarding the initial conditions. Can you go back to the previous slide? Before I pass to the to the solution of the equation, uh, this you see what am I going to do is to solve this uh, solve this differential equation for i, all right? So i of t and i of t I shall obtain in terms of unknown constants which I shall try to evaluate from the initial conditions. One of the initial conditions is that I of 0 is equal to 0, I of 0 minus and 0 plus are the same. The other initial condition I say it is not on I, it is on the capacitor voltage. Can we convert it to a condition on I? This is very illuminating by looking at this equation, this equation, all right. Let us consider T equal to 0 plus. At T equal to 0 plus, what is the value of I? It is 0. <coughs> Di dt is not 0, not necessarily. I can be 0, but it can be rising. So, and what about this integral? Zero. 0. And therefore, do not you see that my initial condition is L Di dt 
at t equal to 0 should be equal to v naught and therefore d i d t at t equal to 0 should be equal to v naught by L. This is the other initial condition. So, there are two initial conditions. It is a second order circuit. It stands to reason that you have to, to solve a second order differential equation you require two initial conditions. All right, And the two initial conditions are that the initial current is 0 and that the initial rate of change of current is simply the initial voltage across the capacitor divided by the inductor. The resistance does not come into play anywhere in this. Why not? Because I of 0 is 0. So, there is no drop in the resistance. Are, this, are these two initial conditions clear? Can we go ahead to the solution of the circuit? Once again, once again we shall proceed from a physical reasoning rather than integrating directly physical or using an integrating factor as we do in mathematics. We do not want to lose sight of the physical situation and so we say all right, we notice that I di dt and d2 i dt2 must be of the same functional form otherwise their sum cannot be 0. If one is a sine, the other is a cosine and the other third is an exponential obviously it cannot, it cannot cancel and therefore we argue uh, once again that I must be of the form of A e to the st, A e to the st. Now if I substitute this here and clear A e to the st, A e to the st cannot be 0, clear A to the st then what we will get is S squared L plus S r plus 1 over c shall be equal to 0. Do you see this? I have omitted a couple of algebraic steps. I simply substitute this, take two differentiation, I shall get S times r here and S squared times L, A e to the st I cancel because it cannot be equal to 0 and this equation, yes, A is 0 at that is at t equal to 0. Yes, sir. So you, yes, you sir. Have to apply that ah, okay. <laughs> All right. We shall apply that boundary condition later. All right. This is a first order, this is not a first order circuit. So, this cannot be the complete solution. We are trying the form of the solution. We say, is this, does this qualify as a form of the solution? In the, let me clarify this. In the first order circuit, we are trying a complete solution. We know the solution has to be of the form A e to the st. Here, obviously, since it is a second order circuit, the solution must be more complicated than A e to the st. Because at t equal to 0, as you rightly pointed out, since i of 0 plus is equal to 0, a has to be identically equal to 0. So, this cannot qualify as the total solution. But does this qualify as a form of the solution? This is what we wish to find out. And the physical situation will immediately bring in the total solution. As you see here, as you see here, this equation S r by L plus 1 by L c equal to 0, this is a quadratic equation. So, there are two values of S which satisfies the equation. There are two values of S. Originally, it was only in the first order circuit, it was only one value of S. Here, there are two values and these two values are S 1 2. You know, you know what this means. Subscript 1 comma 2 that we write both of them simultaneously. And you can see that this is minus R by 2 L plus minus square root of r by 2 L whole squared minus 1 over L C. There are two possible values of S and therefore, there are two possible solutions of the original differential equation and these solutions are, uh, my equation is L d 2 I d t 2 plus R d I d t plus i by c equal to 0 and the two solutions are 
minus r by 2l plus minus square root of r by 2l whole square minus 1 over lc and therefore the solutions are e to the s 1 t and e to the s 2 t both of them shall satisfy the original differential equation and multiplying by any arbitrary constant will not affect the solution and therefore we say these constants are let us say a 1 and a 2 both of them individually satisfy the original differential equation. So, the sum of them should also satisfy the original differential equation and this qualifies as the general solution to the original differential equation. We shall not apply the initial conditions till we reach this point, till we get the general solution to the equation. A e to the s t was a trial solution. We see that indeed it is of the correct form, but it does not satisfy the initial conditions. Therefore, why, why is it so? Because it is a second order circuit and therefore there must be two linearly independent solutions. Is this phrase known to you? What does linear independence mean? That by multiplying this by a constant I cannot get the other solution. You see e to the s 2 t cannot be obtained from e to the s 1 t by simply multiplying by a linear constant all right. These are two independent solutions and now we can apply the initial conditions. The first initial condition is that i 0 is equal to 0 that is a 1 plus a 2 should be equal to 0 <coughs> which tells me that a 1 should be equal to minus a 2. All right. In other words, the general solution therefore shall be of the form a1 e to the s1 t minus e to the s2 t. a2 is simply minus a1. And the other initial condition is that di dt at 0 should be equal to v0 by L, which means that a1 now make a d dt and put t equal to 0 d d t of e to the s 1 t is s 1 e to the s 1 t and if you put t equal to 0 then it is simply s 1 minus similarly s 2. Is that clear? I have omitted that differentiation step and therefore a 1 is equal to v 0 by L s 1 minus s 2. Is that okay? All right. And therefore Therefore, my total solution i of t is equal to v0 by L s1 minus s2 times e to the s1 t minus e to the s2 t. This is the total solution. Total solution to the equation. Now, so far I have not said anything about the nature of these two quantities S1 and S2. If you recall S1 and S2 are given by minus R by 2 L plus minus square root of R by 2 L whole squared minus 1 over L C. The nature of these two solutions obviously these two constants obviously shall depend on the discriminant that is D which is R by 2 L whole squared minus 1 over LC. If D is greater than 0, then obviously the two roots shall be real, distinct. Anything else that you can say? Negative. Isn't that right? Minus R by 2 L plus a quantity which is less than R by 2 L obviously shall be negative quantity. When the sign is negative, minus r by 12 minus obviously the whole thing is negative. So, all are distinct, these are real, distinct and negative. If d is equal to 0, obviously that is possible by a combination of r, l and c, you could make them equal to 0. They are real, coincident, we do not say equal, they coincide, they coalesce upon each other and they are still negative. negative okay. If d is less than 0, 
these roots are complex. Why complex? Because there is a real part and d is less than 0, so this will be j times, okay, square root of minus 5 is j times square root of 5, where j is equal to square root of minus 1, all right. So, you will have minus a real quantity plus minus j times another real quantity. So, it will be complex, distinct, we can't say positive or negative, conjugate here. Yeah. Suppose r is equal to 0, then the roots are not, com not only complex, they are purely imaginary, they are purely imaginary because this is 0, this is 0, square root of minus 1 over Lc, so purely imaginary. To emphasize, you said purely, okay, purely imaginary, distinct and conjugate. We shall talk about this, pardon me? They are of course conjugate. So, when d is 0, we hmm. have different solution for the differential equation. We will have, we have two independent solutions and when d is 0, we, s1 will be equal to s2. In the case of repeated roots, in the case of repeated roots as you know in the differential equation, we have to have a1 plus a2t multiplied by e to that multiply by the exponential, but we will not bother about that. We will go by this and see what exactly comes from the physical picture, all right. We will look at it from more a physical point of view because it is introduction to electronic circuits that we are learning, not solution to differential equation. This is incidental. We have to uh, solve the equation to be able to find um, a solution. Let us consider this case d greater than 0, that is uh, roots are s1, s2 are real distinct and uh, negative, all right. And you already know that the current solution is equal to V0 by L S1 minus S2 e to the S1 t minus e to the S2 t. D greater than 0 means that R, L and C are such that this quantity R by 2 L whole squared let us look at this, this is also interesting. <laughs> D greater than 0 means what? That R by 2 L whole squared should be greater than 1 by L C, which means that R should be greater than R square should be greater than 4 L by C, is that right? That is R should be greater than 2 L by C square root of L by C. There are two things I want you to notice that it depends on the total resistance in the circuit, okay. If the total resistance in the circuit is large compared to is greater than twice square root of L by C, well the roots will be real and distinct. If you, if you take a resistance at a step for example in the circuit and gradually reduce it, then you can see all the phenomena. That is you can see real effect of real distinct negative roots, effect of real coincident negative roots, effect of complex roots and effect of purely imaginary roots. If you simply go on adjusting this resistance, when it is 0 you will see completely imaginary roots and so on, all right. The other thing that I want you to notice is that square root of L by C obviously has the dimension of resistance, isn't that right? So. So, if you wish to express the dimension of L in terms of the dimension of C and R, R squared, then obviously it would be this, right? L would be equal to C R squared. Now, let us take a, a numerical example for this case. Let us suppose about what? How does this circuit behave? This is what I am going to show you. This is what I am going to show you with numerical examples. We have an example in which let us say uh, 
L equals to 1 Henry, C equal to half farad and R equal to 4 ohm, all right. If this is the combination of the elements, then you see S12 is minus R by 2L, so it would be minus 2, is that okay? 4 divided by 2 into 1 minus 2 plus minus square root 4 minus 1 over LC, 1 over LC is a bit of mistake. Let us take, uh, would you pardon me, let us take C as one third farad. I want to keep life simple, all right. Let us take C as one third farad, then this will be 4 minus 3, which means that it is minus 2 plus minus 1. The roots are real, distinct and negative. So, the roots are minus 1 and minus 3 and therefore, I of t is equal to V0 by L is 1, S1 minus S2 is obviously 2, is that right? Minus 1 plus 3 minus 2 and then E to the minus t, S1 is minus 1 and S2 is minus 3, so E to the minus 3 t. Okay. Let me write it down again. I of t is equal to V0 by 2 e to the minus t minus e to the minus 3 t. How do you think the current will behave with time? How shall it vary with time? Obviously, at 0 minus, the current was 0. At 0 plus, the current will be 0. Put t equal to 0, it is 0. At infinity, at infinity, when t goes to infinity, this term goes to 0, this term goes to 0, 0 minus 0 is 0. So, at infinity, it must again be 0. Let me show infinity on a finite plane, okay, by a break. Let us say this is the point at infinity. So, infinity is also 0. In between, the current is positive, it does not change direction, it cannot be 0 and therefore, it must have a maximum it must have at least one maximum. In a higher order circuit, it can have more maxima and minima, all right. So, it must have at least one maximum. So, it must go to a maximum and then goes to 0. We show a break because we are showing infinity on a finite plane, all right. So, the current attains a maximum value somewhere and one can by differentiating this find out at what value of time at what value of time the current attains a maximum and then what happens. One can also find out the total charge that is delivered to the circuit. What do you think will be the total charge? It will again be C times V naught, that is one third V naught. If you integrate this from 0 to infinity, you shall get the same expression. On uh, Monday, we will consider the case of a complex root that is d less than 0 and we will have fun, more fun there.